Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. In this video, we're looking at Surge. Now, uh, for those who follow uh, my High Hertz videos assiduously, which no doubt you will do, you'll know that I covered Surge a little bit in my 10 best VST list, but I didn't go much into it. For those who are even more assiduous, you will know that just over three years ago, I made the world's longest video about Surge. So it's kind of interesting because it's three years and a couple of months since then. That's not why I chose this, it's just I said, okay, look, I'll, I'll look over this again because there have been repeated um, uh, questions about it. Uh, and so, of course, I had to look back and go, okay, when did I do that? Thinking that, oh, maybe it was a year ago, but no, it was actually over three years ago. So what does Surge sound like? Well, it's very varied. Clayus, the fellow um, who uh, first started this project, um, and, and I knew him online because I had been a big advocate for his, uh, his former sample player called Short Circuit, which I loved a lot, and I was actually brought in on, on this as beta tester and to build patches. Uh, I did move away because I didn't actually like the synth at the time. That was on me because I was hoping for something different. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a powerful synth, just didn't really grab the market, and then Clayce went off and worked for a, um, a door manufacturer. Now, I always recall it as being Bitwig. That may not be accurate, but nonetheless, uh, the quality of his work got him snavelled for somewhere else. Good on him. And then this got put out into the open source community a year or so ago. Well, actually, no, sorry, not a year or so ago. Three years ago, over three years ago, and a team put themselves together and picked it up and have put it back into, into the public as a free instrument. And that's great to see. And going back to it with that span of years, because there were quite a lot of years between when I was working with Klaus on this and, and it reappearing, I'd really got a lot more understanding under my belt and realized obviously that I'm far more of a digital synth guy than an analog synth guy. And this made a lot more sense to me. And it's like, oh, now I get what you were doing. Uh, I think he was a little ahead of his time. Very broadly, what we have is an incredibly powerful synth that if you're not used to synth architecture, can seem complex. Now, it was laid out in many ways a little bit like modules, a little like a modular synthesizer. And it's actually a pretty clever or wise layout, but it can be confusing. The original GUI was dramatic, shall we say. There are a couple of options now, some of which are kinder than others. Uh, that's probably a good addition. But very simply put, we have this powerful synth that you hear here, with a really powerful modulation architecture. And then we'll see we've got scenes. We've got a scene A and a scene B. Scene B is a complete duplication of the synth. So it's the same synth twice. Now we can run them as single. So you're hearing scene B, you're hearing scene A. We can key split so we can define where we want them to split. So scene A is playing down low. Scene A is playing up top. Not the best key split sound. You can channel split, which basically technically means that it's multi-timbral. We won't get into that. Or dual, which is where both scene A and B are playing at once. So we can hear both of those sounds. And if we think the um, scene B is a little too loud, we can adjust it. So it's more powerful than you initially think because it's possible to create two completely separate patches and layer them on top of each other. And because of the versatility of the instrument, one layer alone is pretty amazing because you've got access to three oscillators. 
uh, and each of those oscillators, um, in most cases, can have up to 60 in unison voices, which is a lot. Uh, so being able to, to layer the pair of these together like this gives you access to an incredibly powerful synth. We'll quickly look through some presets, then we'll start to dig in a little bit more. Over time, there have come to be a lot of sounds. They're the original class sounds. Technically, it's possible there may be some, some patches in here that were mine. I honestly don't remember what I delivered, if anything, to him. There are also a lot of third-party patches. Some of the number of patches from third-party developers is slim. Uh, some of them are fairly high. Um, you may find something you like, you may not. I see this more as being a, here's a set of possibilities. There's also user patches which I haven't saved any of. Something Benedict always likes is initialize patch. There is an initialize patch function. So if we do this, we got that. The, um, actually we'll just pull this back now. Class patches can seem a little less exciting, not because he was a bad patch designer, but patch design back then had more, well, shall we say rules. You tended to make patches drier back then than you do now. So older patches will tend to seem simpler than modern patches, doesn't make them bad. It actually makes them more usable, provided you understand that um, you need to work out how to use them. Their whole aim was to make these sounds as versatile as possible, not to provide a press a key, have an insta hit sort of thing. So that's why you may notice that there's, there's a little bit of uh, a variety. Um, I haven't heard this one. See, lots of effects piled on top to make kind of a, here's a, almost a whole drone piece in, in one sound. It's pretty cool. So quite a lot of patches, but it's, th th you see them more as a sense of what's possible, or at least that's how I always see patches, as a sense of what's possible. So I might go, hmm, that's cool, I like that glassy sand, how did they get there? So we know that it's really just oscillator one, mute it, oscillator one's gone, using this alias form, which I'm not going to pretend to understand, and then these particular effects. If we turn off the effects, now we can go, okay, here's how we've gotten to there. I can see that they used an additive shape and that clearly says a lot about the sound because it's very additive in sound. So a lot of it is derived from the oscillator form and then these effects. So that gives me a sense of, okay, well, if I'm, if I like the timbre, I can work out how to, to sort of get my way there. That's, that's my approach to patches. Something that I do like in here, as well as the initialize, is we can create a patch and we can set it as default. There are a couple of things in the default patch, the sort of the init patch, which I don't love. And I could change them now because there is a set current patch as default. So good work, boys and girls there. Let's have a look at Surge themselves. As I said, they are uh, now at their own little um, open source community thingy. Uh, and so if you're looking to get Surge, while you will see it advertised in lots and lots of places, free this, that and the other, my advice very strongly is go to the Surge synthesizer at their GitHub. If it doesn't look like this, it's probably not the best place to be downloading from. Doesn't mean that it is bad, but it just always strikes me as better to go to the source rather than to go to somewhere else. The site gives you a pretty reasonable overview of what the instrument is capable of, which is great if you know what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, if you don't know, you might be a little bit like, huh. 
in which case this may be a little bit of a tricky synthesis to start with, but providing you can be wise enough to say, I'm going to manage the bits that I understand and ignore the rest, then there's absolutely no reason that you can't start with synthesis here. Just understand, pick the path you're going to take and say, I'm going to, I'm going to get comfortable with this module and this module and this module and ignore the rest. A lot of people can't do that. It's like they see a pile of knobs and go, oh, I need to learn every single knob individually as though they all are unique. No, they're not. You know, you look at a, at a large form mixing board, you know, the big SSL kind of thing, and you go, oh, no, there's 37 trillion knobs. I can never learn all of those knobs. You don't need to learn 27 trillion knobs. If it's a 16 input desk, then you actually only need to learn vertically one vertical channel once you know how one channel works you've basically mastered the desk there's some other stuff over on possibly returns um, and masters but that's pretty small generally speaking so the same with the synthesizer you can get comfortable with one form in here let's say just the basic sawtooth form you can get comfy with that comfy with one of the filters they're both exactly the same, the amp and filter envelopes, and ignore everything else, and you're still winning. So don't be off-put by the fact that there's quite a lot of stuff here. Uh, pick it up as you need it, because if you don't need it, you don't need it. Ignore it. But the website is here. You can download for free. I will generally advise getting the, the latest official release. There are some nightly builds, but they're bleeding edge and you may have some issues with them. The other interesting thing, which I'm unable to test, is that uh, they are also picking up the new CLAP standard, which doesn't mean a lot to any of us right now, other than being a potential light on the horizon. And that is that uh, the CLAP is a, um, a format competing with VST that's been put together by Bitwig and Uhi. Uh, of Zebra Diva fame. And they are looking at trying to put something on the ground, uh, a VST uh, competitor which works better, that, that has better features. Because Steinberg uh, and their VST format, while great in certain ways, has been a um, pain in the proverbial for many developers. And so they're looking at saying, hey, we think we can do better. So getting early, early adoption with a lot of the open source type community doesn't mean that it's going to fire, but it definitely helps because some synths might really benefit from it. And this one is probably one that could benefit from that because one of the features is per note modulation, which is a, it's not MPE, but it's a little like MPE. It's opening up what is possible because VST has not opened all the digital doors that it could have. But we still have the issue that MIDI 2, which has opened more digital doors, has not really been adopted by anybody. So despite the fact that the spec is better, it's irrelevant because no one's used it. So the clap thing is interesting, but it's a possible light on the horizon might go nowhere. Might as well roll into our good and bads, and then we will start looking through the feature set of the instrument. What's good? It's very, very powerful. Surge is an incredibly powerful synth. You don't fully understand that until you've spent some time with it. Now, again, some people might go, oh, but if it's that powerful, I'll never understand it. I better go get a synthesizer with two knobs. Your business, you're going to miss out. Uh, it's as powerful as you want it to be. Ignore what you don't want or need. But the fact that it is very powerful means that you can get a very wide range of sounds from it. If you come in wanting the usual wide range of one wub wub wacka wacka eh kind of sound, I think that it's definitely doable because there's the wavetable stuff in here. Just don't ask me because I can never do that sound, nor do I actually want to do that sound. But in terms of creating beautiful sounds that you can make a whole mix out of, yes, definitely. And there's a big variety of what's doable. It is a very, very classy sound. And while there are other open source instruments that are technically very good, I very, very rarely get them to mix, as in they don't make it to the mix down and the record. 
Whereas Surge, 99% of the time that I open Surge, it makes it through to the final record. It's a very classy sound which can range from being quite classy analog uh, through to, um, well, icky digital in either a negative or a positive way. It really can be a very beautiful instrument if you use it right. And that's the highest praise for any instrument. It is pretty darned versatile. I would like to write that it is incredibly versatile, but then um, some kind of hairy Harry will hop up and hate me that um, uh, it won't do some technical thing. So it's pretty versatile. Uh, there's just about everything that you might want to do is doable in some form. There are only one or two things that are not doable, but largely those one or two things that are not doable are doable in a different approach. You know, it's like people might talk about, well, it won't do granular, man. And it's like, yeah, I, I listen to granular synths and I could probably achieve the results they're achieving an awful lot faster. <laughs> with a good digital synth and some nice effects than the time that they goof around trying to find God knows what with their granular. It's not that I'm anti-granular, it's just that by the time they've gone through their process of wandering around in the, uh, in the, in the dark, I probably could have said, well, if that's the sound we're looking for, here we can do it with a little bit of FM, a little bit of this, a little bit of whatever. Pretty versatile, very versatile, because it's very powerful. We should look at the negatives because they are there. It is a bit complex. But again, if you can say rather than, oh, that's a bad thing, that that's just where we, where we get the power from and say, I will focus on this module and that module and that module and I ignore the ones that I don't understand until I'm open to understanding them. Its complexity is really not a problem. It is is a little clunky. How to overcome that, I don't know. Some of that has been overcome with the uh, with the, the new team. Uh, they're aware of the, the limits, but some of that is just an inevitability, and the more features they try to put in, the more difficult that may get. Um, I don't know whether it's changeable, but some things it would be nice just to have a sense of how can we have them be more smooth. Probably the biggest one that I've encountered um, in any single, we can say that's a problem, is the import of sample slash wavetable. There isn't an easy solution for doing that if you don't already have serum or something like. There is a manual which seems like it's pretty reasonable. I haven't read the whole thing, but I, I got it where I clicked the uh, the question mark on some things. Now, where is it? Yeah, here, like the, hit the question mark, opens up the manual online. Okay, all, all good. Uh, but opening it up on the wavetable thing, it pointed me towards some having to run, oh, well, if you just run this, you know, I, th I can't remember what language it was, but oh, if you just run this Ruby on Rails with, with X and C minus sharp 74.3, I'm, I'm overdoing it, then you'll just be able to do this and it'll be really pretty easy if you know how to use COBOL. Yeah. <laughs> Would be nicer if there was simply a way to say, import my sample and either play it looped or import my sample through some sort of a window that allows me to turn it into a wavetable-y, sweepy, swoopy kind of a thing. Just some things like that that just don't flow as nicely as they could, should. But this is one of the differences between free or open source software and a paid piece of software like, um, like well, Oofy, like Zebra or something like that, or Reason. Reason have always been, I think, the masters of making things sort of surprisingly smooth and easy. And again, don't jump down my throat if you don't like Reason. I'm merely using them as an example. I'm not the only person who uses them as an example of great usability. Uh, and also, well, I'm not a fan of their effects. I honestly think that their effects are weak kung fu, but doesn't really matter 
because I'm interested in the synth engine, not in the effects. I'm very rarely interested in the effects built in with the synthesizer. I often think they all have weak kung fu or that their kung fu is whack because it doesn't belong there. So I'm not going to go through the effects simply because I don't dig them. There is no reason that you can't like them. What I have done here is added in, let's turn all of them off. Just a little bit of compression if it gets lively and some of the free hertz delay. And now we'll just have enough to take the edge off. That's it. So let's dig in. This is the exciting part of the program or the incredibly boring part of the program. Depends where you sit on this. Let's start with an initialized patch. Quiet. So we are going to work our way through some, but not all of the features. Some being enough to get you to the point where you can make a very detailed patch without having to dig holes for yourself. We start with the structure of the synth. You can ignore that. I showed you, but you can ignore that. We'll look at the oscillator. That's the bit that makes the farty noise that begins the whole thing. It defaults to this classic sawtooth square option, which is fine, but I don't recommend you really go there. So let's move to modern and sawtooth. Modern is one oscillator, but you can default it or open it up with sawtooth or pulse or whatever, or you can default everything to nothing. Double click will reset most things. And then you've got nothing. You can see you've got nothing because, well, you've got nothing. You can raise the sawtooth or lower the sawtooth. If you don't understand what being upside down means, ignore that. Let's just raise it. I have a sawtooth. If I raise this, I've got a pulse wave. If I've got a pulse wave, I can adjust its width. It doesn't go 100% of nothing, but it goes close enough to do the job for most situations. Or I can raise to triangle. Plus, of course, I can combine a couple of forms. That works just dandy. Width only works if I've got some pulse wave in the mix. So let's say I add some pulse wave in. You can see how it changes the, the form. That looks pretty groovy. It looks like a train. Cool. That gives us our basic oscillator form, the kind of fundamental farty noise that we think we are going to make the rest of our sound out of. You can then sync. What oscillator sync is, is a little technical, but don't fuss about it. When, there's, when that's down or off, you're just hearing the oscillator as it is. If we take a simple form, you can see this is, is kind of getting funky. It's going, okay, there's our shape, but now our shape's kind of starting again. What that means is that we feed another oscillator, which you don't hear. It's just that the rate of that oscillator tells this oscillator to start its waveform again. And when those two don't match, when they match, you get the form exactly as it is. When they don't match, then you start to have that little jaggy line where it has to go and start again. And that and start again gives us a hard edge. Soft, hard. Now, when we've got an exact multiple of the original oscillator and the modifying oscillator, then we find that it merely raises itself in pitch, so to speak. And you can get a cool gnarly sound out of that. But if you want to do Jupiter 8 type of sound, generally won't do that, but it doesn't mean that you don't. We then got unison. Unison to tune, but does nothing on its own because we have to give it a couple of voices. If we give it, say, three voices, we can go from no detuning uh, to a whole, a whole semitone, which is, of course, just out of tune. 
but there are times in which that is actually very useful to give a, a really nice kind of background, especially for noise type, digital noise type sounds. So if you're wanting that, I think it's seven. That's your super saw type sound. I know this made a little differently, but we're not gonna bog down in any particular thing. Up here, we've got key tracking. We need that on, otherwise it doesn't pitch. But in Cajun situations, you don't want a sound to pitch. So you can turn that off. And then we've got re-trigger. Re-trigger, you won't hear a lot of difference on the surface. You will notice at the beginning of those notes, there's a, there's a more definite pop or punch. So, in terms of a... Let's just turn that off. In terms of, a, of an analog synth, say, uh, a, um, a Juno 106 triggered its waveform as you press the key. So that and the SH-101, why they were favoured as bass machines, because you got a tighter sound. It wasn't a warmer sound, it was actually a thinner sound, but it was a tighter sound on the... So if you're looking for that little tiny bit of punch or cut on your sound as it started, then putting re-trigger. If you're after a looser, more analogy kind of sound, uh, then you leave your re-trigger off. Generally with synths you want it to be off but there are times where you want it to be starting its waveform at exactly that point. FM synthesis as well you commonly want the re-trigger on. But we will leave it off. So that's our basic oscillator form. The other one that you will have is sine and this does seem a little different in each of these, actually tell you the truth. Yeah, <laughs> they're actually different. The sign one is different. I thought they were the same, but there's a slight difference there. This allows you to get a sine wave being the purest of tones. You could technically use that for FM, but we'll leave that one alone for the moment. So we can create, again, a complex. Mishmash oscillator form that's all kind of locked together. Those three forms inside there, they're all locked together. They always will be. Uh, let's have a little bit of detune, just a pair of voices. That's our oscillator. There are other forms. There's a wavetable oscillator, which can get you access to pre-built waveforms, which is, in this case, 60 slides, which we can morph through. And if you wanted to do the woo, whack, 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 ugly paint stripper kind of sounds, that's probably where you're gonna to wanna to start. And then you might want to FM a pair of them together. We'll get into that later. Wavetables are great for where you want evolving sounds. Wavetables are not better than simple synthesis, it's just they've done a certain amount of the work already. They can sound glassy as you hear here. But there are a whole pile of those there. The wavetable, tons of sounds generated. One shot means that they're just an imported sample. If you import a sample, it has to be wave 1644. Uh, but if you import the sample and it doesn't have that extra information with it to, that, that allows Surge to see it as a wavetable, it'll import it as one shot. It will not loop. Tried it, read the manual, that's just how it goes. Like I said, it, it is a limit. Hopefully it's something that they will fix because if they want to bring in the wavetable crowd, they've got to help people to get their own wavetables. Uh, and I was, I was speaking to somebody uh, blah, 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 from a different instrument, or oh, I can't remember what it was, and they were frustrated because the manufacturer had built this instrument that would do the wavetable thing, 
but then was relying on, oh, well, you need serum to be able to make your own wave tables. And he and I were both of the, well, bugger off with that then kind of approach. If you want to get people doing the wave table thing, which is pretty fascinating, you need to give them a really nice, easy way to import their own sands and wave table eyes of them. And there are a few synths that do make it pretty easy. You just import a sample and it goes, all right, <laughs> I'll turn that into a wave table for you. So hopefully in time we'll see that. Sampled sands, some of the Waldorf sands, so... As to which you use to the woo whack 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 this kind of sound, don't know, that's your business to work out. Some of them will be there, no doubt, um, uh, no doubt some of Venus theories do that but there are a pretty large selection of wavetables if you don't just mind kind of wandering around blindly going oh well which one might have which one might i want um emu i don't know whether emus are, are, are like a someone's signature um or that they've come from an emu instrument but definitely i don't recall my emacs <laughs> ever having anything like this. But that looks like an instrument, so if you envelope this parameter correctly, you can, well, basically doing the PPG thing, so you can change the tone. So we, we might start here and fade out or something. You know, there's various ways. You choose how you want to use wavetables. Um, Window, which is a different form of wavetable. It offers you all the same wavetables, and then window just means that how, how it does the math. So you can hear here that sounds different from what we had before. Sine is just a pretty pure sine wave. There seem to be various different forms. I haven't looked at this form. Uh, feedback is a form of FM. In a DX7, you have feedback, and if you're after a nice electric piano, that's the form. And so you can have behavior of different types. Again, you've got to get sort of digging and understand how they work. If you're not interested in the short term, ignore it. There are then two FM inside the oscillator oscillators. We've got our. Um, first oscillator, which is going to be a sine wave, which it should be. Modulation 1 amount and modulation 1 ratio. If you want to know a little bit more about that, go watch the um, Dext video, which should be out by now, where we talk about the, ra the ratio relationship creates how we get different tones. So we can hear that real DXE kind of thing. And then modulation two, so we can modulate again. Slight offset of those. Change their phase, sometimes that can make a real difference. And then feedback. And we can run that at the back end, and that can be our instrument. If we put a little bit of um, envelope on it, that can be our instrument. We could control some of these, uh, which we'll look into modulation soon, um, or we could put filters over them. Easy, easy, easy. And then there's another FM, which has three operators inside it. Same fundamental thing. This is new. We'll open this back up. It's, a, I assume, Carplus Strong uh, oscillator, which is using an exciter, something to set the whole process off. We can have a burst of noise or a constant noise. If we change the level of that, then in theory, this is like a bow on a string. They give you two strings in here. Uh, 
and a couple of parameters. Kind of interesting. It's one of those things that would take a little bit of time to get your head around. But you can make guitars. You gotta sort of get your head around how to make that happen. It's not necessarily the coolest car plus that I've used, but it's interesting and no doubt there's a, there's a fair potential of getting interesting things out of it when you work out how to make it do cool stuff. And then twist, which I haven't looked at at all. Um, you've got different forms. So this is a, an algorithmic, oh that's cool, this is an algorithmic oscillator by warping certain types of waves and forms. You need to take some time to understand that one. But this is very much within Claire's mindset of making these really interesting digital synth forms. So obviously there's a fair amount of stuff that can be done from here. You will tend to make very digital, quite aggressive sorts of sounds because they're sounds that wouldn't exist easily in nature. It's not that that form can't be created in nature, it's just it wouldn't be static like this. So that's where we would tend to have... And this is where the beauty comes in. If we're just listening to our oscillator alone, we're going to ooh, that's disgusting. But once we start modifying it, then we start to see the absolute beauty of what is available. Ah, uh, twist alias I have not looked at really at all. Again, that sort of modifying things. And then there's a noise oscillator which initially will just sound terrible. But then you can get it up into full white noise or... different sort of versions of noise. I I'm not going to say whether it's a good or bad oscillator. I think it's interesting for sure. So dig in, play with that, see what you get. It's also possible to bring in external sound so you can use uh, surge as just a big effect unit should you like now now that does not mean that you can't access the effects on their own there is actually part something that comes over which is just the effects unit which you can insert and use as effects on some other synth um, entirely your business this means you can fly audio coming from your door like audio tracks somebody singing or whatever and whack them through the full features of the instrument. I have not tried this, uh, but no doubt it does work. Let's go back to our basic form and give ourselves a sawtooth. That's our oscillator. Sounds complex, but let's ignore most of what's there. I'm just showing you possibilities of what makes this so powerful and so interesting. Here's our basic form. Let's just... Just loosen that up a little bit. We've got our sawtooth. There's then this mixer. I don't love this mixer, not because there's anything wrong with it, but I don't like how it's set up. So for me, I would not have things muted. I would lower the level of everything that I didn't want. And then if I didn't want to hear something because I was working on something else, let's say I have the second oscillator in, then I could mute it. It just always struck me as horribly backwards. Let me raise the level. So that's the second oscillator here because every oscillator has three options and they don't have to match each other. It sounded a little interesting in tune, yes, because that's offset. 
about we can do the usual thing of setting octaves plus minus three, uh, and then most of them we can detune ever so slightly or dramatically. Seven semitones. Which is an unusual number, but if you need something that, like, say, that's eight, then we could go one. Minus one, and that would be an eight semitone different. You just got to do the do the math in your head. But there's no reason that we can't offset them slightly. We're gonna drop that because we're just gonna work with the one oscillator. Maybe the muting thing was a way of telling the system to turn off the CPU. If so, I guess then the sense for it. But it annoys me. So you've got your three oscillators, you can mix and match your levels to get the right kind of where you want them to be. Quite simple once you get there. There is then a ring modulated section. You can fly in a ring modulation of oscillators one and two against each other. So we'll reset our pitch there. That's a way of getting much more complex wave, or if we've got a nice wave, but we're a bit like, yeah, it's a little too polite. We can push in a little bit of ring modulation to dirty it up. Doesn't sound great at the moment, but that's because we're just working with a, a, a pure wave. So we can ring modulate oscillators one and two together or two and three together. And then we can fly a noise. It's just pure white noise until we look up here and there's the ability to change the color of it. So you don't need to use a noise oscillator to get noise. It can go completely blue, although it's, it's obviously just using a high or low pass filter, or it can go quite brown. It's not the perfect way of doing that, but it gives you a nice result. It's a proper sort of a white noise source. So that is that is cool. And it's there as an extra oscillator. You can then change the overall gain of whatever balance you've made of your oscillators to feed the right amount into filters and what have you. So the mixer, pretty important. If, like me, you are bugged by the mute, 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 mute kind of thing, then probably set yourself up the basic oscillator form that you're likely to want at any given point in time, which may well be the sawtooth. That's always where I like to start. And then you can save this as your uh, current patch as default. Problem solved. Next time we go in it, it'll look like this rather than that. Next, we are looking at filters. Yes, filters. We have got two filter modules. There's this filter module here and this filter module here. You can use either or. If you're going to want a pair of filters, then you can have your first filter and your second filter. Filter one feeds into filter two. So we'll use filter one for now. You can look and you've got off and choose your various forms. You can also cycle through this way, which might be convenient or might be just like, -ha -ha. if you have a filter in action and then you want to try without it, you can hit enabled and it will drop that filter out without actually deassigning your assignment, if you know what I mean. Because if we go off, it turns our filter off and there's no on button again, we have to go find what we were playing with. There is a large selection of filters in here. There were always a good selection of filters when Klaus had it, but now there's a huge selection of filters. Um, 12 and 24 dB. A lot of these have multiple options. At least they did under Klaus. They're just different ways of expressing that particular type of filter. So lots of low pass. Um, the OB ones are quite nice. 
Uh, whether they're realistic to an Obi-Wan, uh, I have no idea. Interesting science. So you've got a lot of quite interesting Lots of different versions of that. So you can get everything from really hard, aggressive TB303 type things, that's the diode if you're specifically trying to emulate a TB, uh, through, to, through to very nice, smooth filters. Uh, lots of band passes, high passes, uh, notches where they just cut a hole, um, tripole. <laughs> <laughs> Need to look a picture of that. Sounds interesting. They would have, and then there are various effect versions as well. The ever lovely all pass, which on its own seems to do absolutely nothing, as is the nature of all passes, um, and some combs. And a sample and hold. This one's kind of. Kind of interesting. It's a nasty fire. <laughs> but the we'll go with the, um, the the low passes. Actually, the um, K35 is always a nice all rounder filter for when you're trying to sound very analog y. The K35 is the um, Core Game MS, MS20 style filter. It's a 12 dB roll off that doesn't get quieter as you add resonance. Your, your Moog style filter will get quieter as it adds resonance. It's trying to keep the overall level of the output the same. This one doesn't, which is part of why they were prone to getting a bit distorty. So we've got nice filters and they do sound good or appropriately nasty if they are meant to be a nasty form. We've got the ability to key track each of our filters, meaning that our center stays the same. Our center can be set here and you can get them so that they open up further as you go because if we were making a violin sound, this wouldn't be a winner, but this would be. If we're making a bass sound, we probably don't want higher notes to get brighter. We probably want them to be either getting slightly duller or possibly even a lot duller. We might reset our point here. So when you're doing a... It puts the emphasis on the lower of those notes and if you're doing a... It's not going blah when you have the higher note. There's no right or wrong, but you, you just sort of set that to, to balance as you see fit. There is also a high pass filter built in. It's very easy with synthesis to just have too much going on in the bottom end. And most people are delighted by that until they come to their mix and struggle with it. So don't be afraid to pull out a little bit of the, the low end. 30, 35, not a problem. Mix engineer is probably going to do it anyway. And you clarify your sound. So it goes from being muddy to focused. Blobby. Focused. And becomes increasingly clear, even though you might think it's thin. So don't be afraid of your high pass filter to clarify the sound that you are making. We'll move on from there now to our ADSRs. We've looked at these briefly. The most important one being the amplifier shape. So this is the level of our sound over time. So instant on, instant off, permanent sustain. That's what we could call the organ sound. That's our organ sound. If we've got an instant on and a... That's sort of our piano. 
or bass sound if it's and it doesn't matter whether we hold or don't hold it's a sort of a harp guitar lute kind of form and then we can get into softer things that's our strings or pad form especially if we pull this back a little So it stops that from being stuck in the mix and, and glugging up with sand. There's so many times I get synth mixes and the synth sounds come in and they sit there like this. <laughs> we, we, we've heard the sand come in, but we don't need to keep it sitting there. So if you pull it down like this, people don't notice that it's faded away and now you've got space for the other stuff to be doing its do. And so various ways that you can set up so attack, decay, sustain, release. Attack is how insta sand or slow sand. We can go up to 32 seconds there, which is not the most excellentest, but good enough. Release being how long it takes for that sand to disappear and the decay being how long it takes to fall to the sustain value that it's going to hold at. So that's a real pad form. Pad being the sound that sits inside the mix and sort of keeps everything moving around that spindle. But again, remember, you don't want your pads to just be dominating the mix. They should just sit there inside. But if you want them to seem loud enough, then you can have them come in fairly loud and drop to their sustain level. There are various ways of looking at how the, the attack and decay and release move. These are here, different forms just change this form. So we can go in a straight line, which is digital and, and actually sounds great, especially with pads, or you can move it so that it swoops in slowly or rushes in faster. You can see the shapes. Play with them, see what you like. Analog just locks that. Initially, there were just two choices. It was curvy or not curvy, but now it makes more sense just to probably be on the digital form. Because you can get there anyway, except you can choose different results here. All cool. We've got the same thing as a envelope generator for our filter. So same exact format. Let's just pull this down a little bit. Uh, and we can assign this. Oh, that's going to filter too. That's why it's not working. You can hear now how that's... If we drop a... So that's moving that filter, opening and closing it as we go. Let's just go with a slightly more aggressive uh, 24 dB. Uh, we'll just, whatever that one is. And we can hear that really nicely. So it can move fast or slow, or of course, and that's a brass form. The organ form with our um, filter would be something like this. piano form would be a little bit slower. I'm an octave 
massive down, so that's why it's a little too thick. But that's how you set up your various movements. It's like a fretless bass. Now that's your basic functionality of the instrument. Right there. You can do everything you need to do just with that. If you want to manage the overall volume, well, you've got a global volume here, or if you're working with scenes, you can change your scene volume here. I would reach for this first, so that way if you're automating your level saying, oh, I'm going to want to turn this down a little bit, then you've got this. Although that only goes to minus 48 dB, that goes to infinitely low. So that's probably the better one to automate. I didn't realize that went to only minus 48, which is good enough because in a mixed term, minus 48 dB is perceived as silence. So either is, is going to work there. There's no right or wrong. There is a wave shaper here. You can put your wave shaper in one of a couple of different positions, but generally, um, if, if, before we get into any of this, your wave shaper can sit in the middle. So we've got this filter, we add a wave shaper, yeah how that's added a little bit of fuzz, it's a bit of distortion on top, I can then filter off a little bit of that. Again, we can choose tons and tons of options, some of which are really aggressive, and we can disable, which means that we haven't lost our form, we've just turned it off, bypassed it. And like I say, some of these forms are going to change the sound in dramatic ways. Because they're a transform function and you can view what the transform function is going to do here. I guess that's kind of interesting to have a display. I, <laughs> I sort of go, okay, fair enough. Um, somebody wanted to add a window that showed this and well, it's there. You may well find that useful. we've got a lot of control in here. These could use possibly some explaining, but I haven't looked at the manual to see exactly what uh, what is there. Heavy fuzz obviously is, uh, well, pretty heavy. So you might actually consider to have no filter here and then just do all your filtering. after. But you see your wave shaper as a way of shaping the waveform that's coming in. They appear to be at the voice level, meaning that they won't act like a guitar, guitar distortion pedal, meaning that each individual voice gets its own wave shaper. But you will find some very interesting results if you're using strange forms. You can hear this, that that's quite changed the sound that we've got. So the more you understand those, the better, but don't fast on them for now, or if you're just looking for a little bit more pedal, then just use a soft push a little bit. It will push a little bit of level, which will make you feel more. But It'll also just add a little bit of burring over the uh, the forms, and you are good. 
The next thing we need to understand is modulation. A synth does need some modulation or it's, it's pretty darn dead. So the first thing we will look at is how do these modulators work? They look a little bit scary, I will say. You click on one to locate it. You can see here now it says LFO2, it says LFO3. If you click it again, you see that it goes green and now everything that is possible to be modulated has gone green, which means that I can grab something. What might I want to modulate? Let's go pitch. We'll do it for the whole instrument, which is, where'd that go? Here. And we can apply a certain amount of pitch. Let's go a little on the grand side. Now I click again, and that assignment is made. In the way the synth was originally done, you just kind of had to remember it. Uh, you can see that this is modulated because it's now blue. These are black, this is blue. It's subtle, but it actually works, and the more you can remember and carry in your head what a, what a synth patch is doing, the better you will do with it. If you go, I can only use this if it shows me everything I've done, you're going to kind of limit yourself because you won't build that being able to visualize in your brain. The more you can visualize in your brain, the better. This is a new feature. We can list off all the modulations that have been made because this never had a visible matrix. Whether this is the best solution, I don't know, but it's definitely there. So we can choose by source, meaning that it will say LFO1, and then show all the assignments. If I had four assignments, it would be showing me four different assignments with their amounts and what have you there. We can turn that off. without having to actually kill it. Or we can choose by target, so... Pitch has come from voice LFO 1. So, and we can also then apparently filter by things. Haven't fully dug into all of that. We can choose which way we see things. So it's, it's pretty good. It's not necessarily my favorite, but they are making strides towards helping to, to clarify or see this information in different ways. But we've got an assignment now that we're going wobbly, we're getting jiggy with it. If we want to change that, we can grab this amount and now we can access it. 1.5. So now it's steeper. Let's look at the LFO itself. Remember, if we want to modulate, to Fiddle with LFO1, we've got to choose it, but without it being lit up. There we go, that's what I'm hoping to hear. Wobbly, we want it to be wobbly. We can change the speed of our wobbliness from uncomfortable and drunken up into FM. Well, let's say that's about right. We can finesse the amount here or here. Bear in mind if you choose here, if you've used this assignment to various different places, let's say to the filter as well, then it will change overall. Pretty standard stuff. You can change the phase, which generally isn't going to make a difference, but if you're going, but, but I need this to always be, then you want key trigger and then change your phase so that it starts from the point where you want it to. Deal with that only if it's an issue. You can also have things as free run, which means this is like an analog synth that the oscillators for the LFO is just always running. We can deform that shape, which means that we can modify the shape slightly. And you might think, why would I ever want to do that? Because I would need the perfect wave. Because the reality is when somebody is vibratoing a string, guitar, fiddle, what have you, they're not actually using a perfect sine wave form. It's actually deformed a little bit. So that's entirely probable. So you end up with a nicer, more organic sort of a feel. 
We'll pull this back up. You can choose different forms. The deformation obviously relies on that. We've got this nice and audible. We've now got a modifier already built in on this, which is great because quite often um, LFOs can be good, but then the lack of ability to modify them can be a total pain in the patootie. We can now set it so there's a period of time before the vibratoing starts. We can have it start but fade in. We can obviously have a little from column A, a little from column B, which is very common. Fiddler starts fiddling and then next note and starts vibratoing. And so we can also have that fade out. Great for brass or sounds that have an intense amount of movement. So bells will have an intense amount of movement when they're first struck and then it settles over time. Generally, you want your release to be sort of wherever you're at, but it's got a nice ADSR with a hold function in the middle. Uh, that is great. So we can give our sound a lot of character from how that behaves. There's nothing to stop you from using uh, either a macro, which is just a a sourceless um, a sourceless modulator. This is the source in itself. Ooh, creepy. <laughs> That's a bit different. You'd have to read the manual that way. I've not used a macro. It's weird that I can just pull bits off this instrument. Just leave them lying on the floor, get stuck in my feet. But we could use the mod wheel. We could say, okay, I'm going to assign the mod wheel to amplitude here. Let's just put our amplitude to nothing. A mod wheel to here. So now when I've got my LFO1, need to fix that back up. I can use my mod wheel to control how it works. If we want to get rid of that assignment, we can either sort of undo it or right click and modulation from mod wheel, make it go away. It all makes sense. The other form we've got there are other forms in here, but I'm not going to go into them. But this one's super handy, the MSEG. So let's assign an MSEG to, let's say, our filter. That's actually really a nice sound, i got to say. That is a nice sound. So we're going to take our MSEG and assign it to filter 1. We'll give it plenty of pedal. And now it's using this form here, which we can edit. They can be unipolar or bipolar. That's a little neatly put in, so it can make it a little, a little hard to find in a hurry where to turn it off. So this is going in both directions. If it's unipolar, it only goes in one direction and behaves more like an envelope. You can run it as an as a, a um, LFO or an envelope, and you can loop as well. I didn't work out what all the rules are. It looks like we can choose our start and stop point here. 
We can change the rate. But mostly if we're running it as a... This seems to have extra stuff happening that I'm not aware of. Oh, oh, now I've lost it. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those ones that uh, there's no immediate way to... Oh, hang on, if I control click, I can get back there. All right, so... So control click allows me to choose... That's fine, it's, it's a reasonable thing. Would just be nice to have... Ah, oh, you double click here. All right, I found it. So fair enough, it's there. If I'd read the manual, I'd know those things, but again, you know, I choose not to read the manual deliberately to work out what's what's happening and what's not happening. So we can have our, our envelope forms. And then you can choose different things to be done. And I'll leave you to go through these to understand them but you can have linear s curves bezier curves uh, and you can also have hold which means that they're the square form so each block that you put in that's hold you see will just be and I'm not quite sure why that's repeating because I'm thinking it shouldn't repeat oh there you go you can also make it go off by clicking that loop mode off oh okay it needs to be off I thought it was on gate before so now it's just an envelope but I can actually let's say So in reality, it is a pretty darn versatile MSEG. Not the very, very easiest I've used, but the more versatile you want to make your MSEG, the more complex it gets to use. You've just got to understand the logic of the keys and the, and the controls to make it work. Not using the manual will, of course, slow things down for you a little there. MSEGs give you a huge amount of versatility. They will do your brain in to start with, but take your time. Once you're comfortable with envelopes and you go, you know, it would be nice if I had a little bit more control over that, MSEGs are your friend. Again, with LFOs, and you go to, oh, I'd like to have a bit more control over that. Look at the MSEG. Because it's really going to open up a lot of doors for you in, in what you do. Uh, and now, just the overall writing of the instrument. Then we've got this section up here, which I've dipped into a little bit. We can have our oscillators drift aloud a little bit. In some situations, you want a fairly high setting. In others, you know, more than a percent or so will become problematic for you. Exactly how it sets that drift, I'm not sure. It may be in the manual. You've seen we can change noise color. So if we have a little bit of noise in the... We can change the... Nice. Probably a bit quiet though, I must admit. And I'm sorry if that seemed too quiet all the way through. Hey, quite cool. You've got the various modes, polyphonic, monophonic, 
and different behaviors read the read the book on how the different behaviors perform you've then got this which feels funny i will say but it makes sense in its own right but it is probably one of the least versatile parts of the instrument whilst adding a whole pile of extra versatility to the instrument and that is that these separate oscillators here we can fm them together in various ways you think that you can do various things with this picture but you can't you've just got various options so no fm is just straight what you're hearing if we now fm oscillator 2 to oscillator 1 remember oscillator 2 is currently playing that let's just get rid of this so oscillator 2 obviously if we have complex wavetables or something like that then we are going to get nasty noises which is perfect for you paint stripper people and then we can have oscillator 3 fming to oscillator 2 which is then fming to oscillator 1 or 2 and 1 separately operating on number one. And you'll generally need to re-trigger the notes. And that is cool. You just got to kind of get your head around it and be comfortable. You sort of think, oh, but, but I'd like to have more versatility. But no, look, this is the way it's built in and it does work nicely. And then we can configure how our filter setups work. Oh, I think that's a little different from last time. So you've just got different ways of how the synth lays out its modules and has them interact. So that makes it semi-modular. And some of them will ring against each other. Some of them will be full stereo. Some of them mean that there's no feedback or the feedback is as Acknowledged. Okay, that sounds quite cool. It just it changes the way the modules are put together. And if you don't understand it, don't despair at all. Just leave it on. I think it's S two is where we were at. The feedback's not always going to seem to do a lot. What the rules on that are, I, I will not say that I have a full understanding at all. If you wanted to operate as full stereo, then pop it into this mode. But generally the mode that it defaults to is sensible and is going to work nicely. Each scene has its output levels and its output pan, as we showed before. And if there's stereo stuff going on, it's got a width thing as well. So from zero being mono to 100% of what the width is or negative 100% of what the width is. In other words, flippifying it. There is the ability to use the send effect system to send different amounts from each scene to the send effects. Play with that if you wish. And that's a really, really nice sound. Doesn't matter whether it's the sound you'd want to hear, but I've got everything that I've ever wanted from this when it's been the instrument that I've picked up, whether they're um, nice basses that are going to sit in the mix, um, really nice sort of flute, clarinet, oboe lead lines, uh, good pads, nice strings. If you can't get it from here, you're probably just not knowing how to get it from here. It responds beautifully to external effects units. So we've got 
them all that. Just having this guy in. Let's just give it a little bit more time on either side there. Just helping to uh, make that movement to pop out a little bit better. Kind of straight and flat, clarifying that movement, and then of course, the 3 hertz delay, adding a nice kind of uh, tape or springy echo. Now that's a pretty long video uh, because this is a tricky device. Remember again, if you've got here, then that's great. You're on your way to, to being a lot more open-minded about this. Don't feel like you can't start here. Uh, just focus in on one thing. Use the one oscillator form. This um, modern sign is probably where I would start and I, where I would set up as a default. Personally, I would set up my mixer to having the one oscillator up, everything else down in level. Let it go. Um, then just choose your filter you're going to work with. You've got your envelope generator for your filter, your envelope generator for your amp or your overall sound. That's good to go. Set the volume of your sound from here. You're either going to dig the onboard effects or if like me you just think that their, their kung fu is weak, then move out into the real world and use the sound effects processes that you do like. In this case, very deliberately chosen um, ADHD, which is a true joy of a compressor and largely underspoken about, and I don't get why. Um, and of course the free hertz delay, which you can get from higherhertz.com, of course gives you uh, a really nice range of chorusing, uh, nice sort of um, nice little reverbs, especially of the, the old school analog kind of reverbs and, and then right out into delays, echoes, all that kind of stuff, and all of those things at once in a, in a strange kind of a munging process, which makes for a fascinatingly rich kind of sound. Final words are, again, Surge is, is truly an impressive instrument, and anyone who asks me, oh, what's the best free synth out there? Hands down, it is Surge. It is a little oop when you first look at it, but that's more on you than on them. Yes, there are some limits and some, some clunky sorts of things, but it's constantly a work in progress. So, so long as they're able to acknowledge those things and work them through, uh, then, then that's all good. It's still a free instrument that's giving you the power and the ability of $200 instruments, shall we say. Pick a figurator out of the air. Uh, its sound is very, very classy which means that you can move it from ugly to beautiful all within, well, one of these uh, strange drop them wherever kind of macros. <laughs> no idea what the, what the story on those is. Go back. Uh, there, it does seem to be a manual. So if I right click and, and go, what's that about? Chances are, I will have it understood within a, within a couple of minutes. So so kudos on the guys, especially for an open source where manuals are often forgotten. They do generally seem to be running a pretty reasonable manual. So good on them for that. Uh, the um, modulation is enormous because look, you've got six voice LFOs, which can be MSEGs or various other forms. Uh, and then you've got global LFOs. They call them scene LFOs, but they're global. Well, they're global for this scene. So that's another six of them. So you have got 12, I don't have enough fingers, you've got 12 modulation sources on board. That's really impressive. And one of the cool things about the whole modular synth thing is the access to lots of modulation. You can modulate things with things and stuff. Uh, and and that is is super powerful. A fair amount of this, as you've seen, where I brought in the mod wheel to um, modify the 
overall level of LFO1 a fair amount of ability to modulate the modulators. Less of it's needed than is usual, simply because you've got these nice um, envelope generator here. Um, oh, and it's possible to use just the envelope generator on its own to bypass all of this. Um, uh, LFO3, see, it just ignores this, and now it's just an envelope generator. <laughs> cool. So you could have another 12 straight ADSR <laughs> envelope generators. It's access to modulation is enormous and more than you're likely to need um, so bottom line sounds excellent has a huge amount of ability to make your sounds move around and do interesting things and then you can get into all of that stuff with wavetables and other weird ways to make kooky either beautiful or ugly oscillator forms is I think it's unparalleled. I don't think there's anything else that touches it. You just need to take your time to understand its semi-modular nature. So each of these modules, like you can see the, the little boxes, is a module and it's like how they get put together and you can change it overall to a certain extent, which sounds, yeah, but you know what? There's so much you can do between here and here that it, it's, it's very, very vast and deep as to what you can achieve with it. Uh, so, so long as you're not one of those people who goes, oh, but I don't want to know how to program a synthesizer, in which case you shouldn't be asking for what's the best free synthesizer, you should be asking what's the best free preset bank, completely different stories, uh, then hands down Surge is the best one out there for absolutely everything except for sample playback. It is not well equipped for sample playback. I don't fully understand why they don't seem to have made a sample oscillator. They might go, oh, but your wavetable will do it. But no, not really, because it doesn't loop. Uh, it would be nice to see an oscillator form in here, which is a sample. I don't know why they don't do it, because it's dead simple to do. And then from there, they could start to do lots of weird digital stuff to samples that we bring in, whether they're treating them as wavetables or... FMing them to things or whatever, it, it, it then opens up sample oscillators tremendously. You don't need to do anything much past the lock it to middle C or whatever, or maybe tell people what key they want it locked to as root, spread the thing. Good enough. People will ask for all kinds of beat munging and what have you. Fair enough, fiddle with it over time but it should be easy to do and, and I kind of wonder why it isn't done till now but overall anything to do with hard pure synthesis Surge will do to a fair extent and do very very nicely with this really classy sound. I hope you have found this interesting it is a beast of an instrument but don't let that put you off it's a piece of an instrument that you can tame without too much effort uh, and rewards really well with its sound. If you have any questions, hit subscribe, pop your question down below, broad questions, please. Questions that are designed for the, uh, the Surge team should go to them via their GitHub or wherever they ask for you to make questions. Um, if you are interested in the other stream of information, hirehertz.com, which of course is where you can go to to get Hertz delay from. It's free from there. And uh, I use a lot. I made it and I use it a lot in, uh, in lots of mixes. Commercial mixes have uh, Hertz delay all over them already. Um, that's it. Go out, get Surge, download it. It's free. Absolutely great instrument. Go out there. Have fun with it.